Welcome to the Jack Weston MCAT Podcast with your host, Phil Hawkins. And Asai Calderon Muñiz. Good morning, everybody, or afternoon or evening, depending on where you're at. It's morning for us. Um, that is the that is the hazard of trying to work with multiple schedules, as I, I know you're neck deep in med school right now. And so it's like, okay, let's squeeze together on a morning when we can. Um, but I am super excited today that we're going to continue our deep dive into the AAMC sample test, kind of give you guys a little bit of insight into what's going on with the test. I think this is an interesting passage to break down, especially because one of the questions I have a little bit of a problem with, um, and that doesn't happen very often. Like the the number of times where the AAMC, I think, makes has an issue with their, their question they've created is like less than 0.1% of the time. Um, but there is one of those that I think is like, ooh, this one's a little bit iffy. So um, hopefully, I don't know if you guys will see this the, the same way I do. Um, but let's go ahead and kind of dive in. Um, let me go ahead and share the screen with our passage. Um, but I, I, I'm interested in this passage, kind of a not much data, right? It's just a bunch of paragraphs. It seems pretty straightforward. And it might be. Yeah. So getting us started, uh, first paragraph, hydrated oxides of carbon and phosphorus are major components of blood serum and serve as buffering agents to this aqueous medium. So right off the bat, kind of thinking, is there something testable here? Not a whole lot other than they mention buffering agents. And so if they wanted to, they could ask us about buffers. But other than that, nothing, they give us a topic, nothing particularly testable specific to this passage yet. Molecules with the general formula AOM, hydroxide N, where A is the central atom, M is either zero or a positive integer, and N is a positive integer, are either oxyacids or bases. So right off the bat, it's really easy to get tempting and stressed when we see this new formula because it's something we haven't seen before. But if we're patient, they tell us, hey, this is a general formula for oxyacids or bases. So knowing that, we can continue moving forward. For example, the formula for sulfuric acid can be written as, then they give you the formula since we already know sulfuric acid, SO2, hydroxide 2, where A is S, M is 2, N is 2, while the formula for calcium hydroxide is calcium hydroxide 2, uh, A is calcium, M is 0, N is 2. So this is, it feels tricky, but it's straightforward, right? Because they're giving you the name of, of what you're looking at, but they're also telling you, okay, it's following the general formula that we just gave you. And so it's just how many of these molecules, or how many, excuse me, of these atoms do we have as a part of this molecule, right? So we could get questions on that formula, that gener uh, general formula. We could be asked about... Um, the, the central atom itself, maybe some of the, the connections or the bonds between them, but it's worth continuing going forward and seeing what else, in, what other information they provide us. Yeah, I do think it is like, just being really clear, I think most students know sulfuric acid is an acid, right? <laughs> and calcium hydroxide is a base. Most students know these things. This is just kind of a classic MCAT thing of like, Let's come at a topic from a weird angle, right? Like they know that you know about acids and bases, but you probably have never seen something kind of approached in this way. I know I haven't. And like, you know, like going through all of my chemistry background, I don't think I've ever like seen this formula before. And the MCAT writers know this. Um, I do think it is interesting. They mentioned these like carbon and phosphorus hydrated oxides. What they're talking about there is, carbonic acid and bicarbonate, like the bicarbonate buffer system. And then just phosphoric acid can lose hydrogens from like hydrogen phosphate or dihydrogen phosphate. And that can act as a buffer as well. And so kind of an interesting thing, but like they're not really bringing in a lot of new information here. They're just coming at like old information from kind of a new way which is a very MCAT way of doing things. They want to see if you understand the concepts, but they want to test it in strange ways to see if you can deal with, you know, like something a little bit more confusing, still bringing to bear the things you know. Um, I don't think I agree with you, as I don't think there's a lot there that I want to spend a lot of time on. Um, but as we go into the second paragraph, 
it's weird because the second paragraph is so much shorter, but I think so much more testable. Yes. Um, like it's, it's literally like two sentences, right? So it can be theorized that if the central atom A is an alkali or alkaline earth metal, the compound is basic. But if A is a non-metal, the compound is acidic, right? That should make sense, right? Sulfur is not a metal. So sulfuric acid is going to be an acid. Calcium is a metal. So it's going to be um, going to be a basic one. Um, note that obviously on test day, you can always use your periodic table and like take a look at that. And like anything over in here is going to make bases. According to this, anything over in here is going to make acids, which should make sense. Carbonic, sulfuric, nitric, phosphoric acid, all of those are, are things that you have probably heard of or seen at some point. Okay, third paragraph. Longer. Let's see if it's as, as powerful and packs as much of a punch as that second paragraph or not. Because the relationship between the central atom and the acid-base properties of these compounds, the electronegativity of A can be used to predict which chemical bonds in these compounds will break. Okay, so now they're talking about bonds, um, but they're still contextualizing it in the, in the context of this central atom. And so what we saw before was central atom, depending on whether it was a metal or a non-metal, would tell us acid versus base. So it's actually kind of still going along the same lines, right? Um, when the electronegativity of A is relatively small, so that the ele electronegativity difference between A, the central atom, and oxygen atoms is relatively large, the AO bond breaks and the hydroxide ion is released. So again, even just thinking about where these are oriented on the periodic table, this should make sense, right? Because left-hand side of the periodic table, smaller electronegativities, we said that's where um, our bases are going to come from, right? However, when the electronegativity of A is relatively large, the hydroxide bond, or the OH, excuse me, bond, becomes polarized and breaks, releasing the proton ion. So again, this should also make sense, because now if we're on the right-hand side, right, this is the um, non-metals that are the central atoms, and we were told that that's going to be an acid, and so it should release a proton ion. When I first, being very frank, when I first read this paragraph, I was like, what is happening? Like, this is, this is intense. Uh, I like the other paragraph. And the reality is that like what the AMC did with the first paragraph, they're presenting the same information in a new light to see if you can keep up, if you can make those connections and how well you're paying attention. Yeah, I like once again, like you've got the longer paragraph here, but I don't think there's a lot of new information. This is presenting stuff that you should be kind of comfortable with, like sulfuric <laughs> acid versus sodium hydroxide as a base. Um, but they, they're even just kind of like just reiterating this second paragraph. And mm -hmm. so the third paragraph is just a more complex breakdown of how and why things work like this in the second paragraph. Um, and so I probably don't want to get too bogged down in that one other than like, if I get a question, I'll come back here. If they ask me where the thing's going to break and why there's a way for me to kind of come back and look at that. But we finally move on into the last paragraph here, where we have a researcher attempted to un identify an unknown, weird compound. The compound completely dissolved in water and weakly conducted electricity. The hydrogen ion concentration of the aqueous solution was one times 10 to the negative fifth. This is like sending off alarm bells in my head of this is testable. I feel like you got the short end of the stick as I, you had to read the two <laughs> longest paragraphs that were also, I think, the least testable stuff. Um, but this second paragraph, super testable, trying to figure out if something's an acid or a base. This last one is also super testable because they give you some kind of like experimental information. Um, they tell us what the pH of this solution is. So the hydrogen concentration, we can find the pH from that. And they also give us like some details about this unknown thing that dissolved in water and conduct electricity. Just given the rest of the passage, I should know one of the questions that I'm going to see, which is, what is this unknown compound, right? Like, what, what can you tell me about this? I know they just spent three paragraphs telling you about this theory, about understanding this stuff. And then they go into the fourth thing, like, hey, we did an experiment. We ended up with this data. And like, they're going to ask you, like, what does that data tell us in the context of the other paragraphs? So that's something that you should definitely see coming. Um, there's probably, we're in the chem phys section, so there's probably going to be a calculation in here. And this is the only real number they give us other than, like these numbers up in the first paragraph, but those just seem kind of random throughout there. 
Um, and so I can expect this last paragraph is also probably going to have a fair amount of questions to it. Yeah. And this kind of comes back to the idea that we've definitely talked about. Don't judge the questions or an entire passage by individual paragraphs and their difficulty. Sometimes mm -hmm. there are passages that are tougher reads or have components that are tough to read, but that when you get to the questions, you're like, ah, I can do this. I, I've got a handle on this. And finding that the simplest version of of what the author, um, the information that the author in this paper is is presenting, that can be really helpful. Because again, between two and three, the second and third paragraph, the second paragraph a lot clearer. Overall, the same the same idea. Just we're given more explicit mechanism in three. Mm -hmm. So with that, let's go ahead and do the questions. And I'm really excited that I got this question because this is one of the questions that when you see on test it, you should be thrilled absolutely thrilled to have. And it's, what is the pH of the unknown aqueous solution? pH, right, is the negative log of the, oh, okay, there you go, of the nitrogen concentration. They gave us that concentration in the last sentence. So this is the kind of question that I should not be missing on test day. And so the main thing, they also gave us a really nice round number, which can also just be written as 10 to the negative fifth, right? When I go to plug that in, since it's the negative log, right? Log, we're taking, we're looking at the exponent. We can use that shortcut of just looking at the exponent and bringing it out. And then we have that negative. So negative times negative five, five. And yeah. that's it. So this whole thing. Logs. Be is... aware that you do need to also be able to calculate logs if there is another number out front. So for example, if there were, you know, four times 10 to the negative fifth. So if you are not comfortable with logs, make sure that you are comfortable with them on test day, go review, um, because logs are should be quick points for you on test day. Yeah, I wanna do a quick pitch. Um, I occasionally do free lectures on how to deal with math on the MCAT, including logarithms. Um, we do that on the Jack Weston homepage. So if that's something that like, ooh, I don't, I don't understand how to do that. Um, this should be a very quick gimme question. Um, and so the answer is just pH is five. And so you can pick that and move on. Um, mm -hmm. I do want to just kind of point out one other thing here. They told you, um, I guess they didn't tell you. I thought they told you it was an, it was, the solution was acidic. I mean, you should know that this is going to be acidic. And so just those two can be eliminated because um, those are going to be basic solutions. But that's also something that you can do with this. Um, getting a little ahead of myself because a part of what I'm talking about is absolutely tied to the next question. So this is the question I have a little bit of issue with. Um, I think that there are some things that we can gain from this. This is also the question that we should have seen coming, right? So they ask us, what is this unknown compound, right? Ooh. Don't know what's going on there. All right, there we go. Apologize. Quick pop up. Um, so looking at this, the unknown com compound was probably a something. Just from the the like this paragraph, they told us we took this compound, threw it in water, and the pH became five. This thing's an acid, right? It can't be a base. Bases make pHs go up. And so just off of that, you should be able to eliminate um, A and B, which means you're at a 50-50 just because you know, hey, this is an acidic solution. Now, to tell the difference between a weak acid and strong acid is actually a little bit trickier. Um, I know that, so first off, there's a couple of things that I think are a little bit tricky here. First off, they say this compound completely dissolved in water. Right now, I think some students are going to read that and think, oh, this compound completely dissociated in water. And that is a different that means a different thing. Right. Imagine that you had a bunch of hydrochloric acid powder and you threw that into the water and it dissolves into the water. Right. So now that those molecules are not a solid, they're aqueous. Right. That means it dissolved into water and it's completely dissolved. After that, the hydrochloric acid, the chloride is going to let go of the hydrogen. And because hydrochloric acid is a strong acid, it's going to completely dissociate. And so all of the hydrogens will come off of the chlorides. So there's a difference there between completely dissolving and completely dissociating. And in the case of hydrochloric acid, it's complete in both cases. But in the case of something like vinegar, acetic acid, like if you had powdered acetic acid somehow and you threw it into water, 
that would completely dissociate, or I'm sorry, it would completely dissolve, but it wouldn't completely dissociate because vinegar is a weak acid. Um, so you got to be really careful with this. Um, also, I know vinegar is not going to be a solid, but just for, for I, I needed an example. I should have used <laughs> carbonic acid. I think that can be a solid um, at room temperature. So looking at this, saying something completely dissolves in water does not help me with this solution to this question. Um, and so that's something that some students are going to read completely dis dissolved and they're going to think it's a strong acid, but that's because they're thinking about dissociation, not dissolving. Um, after that, they told us this weekly conducted electricity. And I think that this is actually more important than maybe I think students realize. That just means that there are some ions in the water, not tons of ions, right? So the fact that this weekly conducted electricity means we probably don't have as many ions in here as we could have at, had. Um, just to kind of like talk about that dissociation stuff, right? So we're going to have, I'm going to put H... Uh, let's not do O because that makes it look, or a circle. Let's do H triangle, right? This thing is going to dissociate into H plus plus whatever the triangle is minus, right? The triangle just being the rest of the acid that could be like any acid that we have in here. These things are going to conduct electricity. And so the more of these that we have, the stronger we're able, we're going to be able to conduct electricity, right? And so it's a, it's, there's a way to figure out the measurement of the ions in there. So it's completely dissolved, but it didn't conduct electricity great, which tells me that there might not be a ton of ions in there, which tends to push me towards a weaker acid. There's also this thing here where they say the hydrogen ion concentration was 10 to the minus fifth. So that says it's a pH of five. We have to be careful. Because I know a lot of students are going to say like, well, if it's a pH of five, that means it's a weak acid because that's not a super acidic solution. The problem is they didn't tell us how much they added. And that also factors in a lot, right? Like if I throw a drop of hydrochloric acid, yes, it's a strong acid. But if I took a drop of that and threw it in the ocean, like the ocean isn't going to be super acidic all of a sudden because it's so dilute. And so the pH of that solution of the ocean, even when I add the acid, is still going to be around a pH of seven, right? Just because there's so much water and so little hydrochloric acid dissolved in it because I only added a little bit. The concentration matters. Whereas hydrofluoric acid can be a very strong acid. I know we talked about this in an earlier podcast episode as I... But if we had hydrofluoric acid, that's a weak acid. But if you have a really high concentration, like that can be a very low pH, a very acidic solution. So you can't look at the pH and just automatically know if it's a strong acid or a weak acid or a strong base or a weak base because concentration factors into this so much. And that's something I know a lot of students um, get tripped up over. So... My problem with this, like everything in here kind of like seems, the, especially the weakly conducted electricity thing, seems to imply that we have a weak acid. But they didn't tell us the concentration. Like if I added just a very small amount of a strong acid, then yes, that that very small amount will completely dissociate. That will still give me just a little bit of this. Um, and so technically, I think... Uh, this could be a strong acid just at a very low concentration. Um, even if it completely dissociates, if I didn't add much, then when it completely dissociates, I don't have much of the dissociated ions. Um, I think this is one of the questions I have a little bit of a problem with. I think that the MCAT writers should have given a, like a, a measurement of how much they added to this. But the other thing is, there's not a lot of oxy acids. And this is this is a useful thing from outside knowledge, right? If you know the main strong acids out there, there are way more weak acids than there are strong ones. And um, th this formula like does not work with like HBr, HI, HCl, like the hydrochloric, hydrobromic, hydroiodic acid, which is half of the strong acids you should know for the MCAT. And so like, okay, well, it's not any of those. I'm like, oh, so all of a sudden it seems like also from that angle, it seems like it's probably going to be a weaker acid just because there are way more weaker acids than there are stronger ones, including carbonic acid and phosphoric acid, which were mentioned up earlier in the passage. So 
Long story short, I think that this is probably a weak acid. And that's actually what the AAMC says. Um, once again, the AAMC's explanations can be a little bit um, crappy. That's <laughs> a, a, a nice way to say it. Um, in the explanation from the AAMC, they say because the hydrogen ion concentration is so much less than the concentration of your solution, it's got to be a weak acid, but they don't give us the concentration of the solution. So like the answer, the explanation that the AMC gives us is referencing things that are not in the passage. And like, I don't know how they expected us to find that. So I'm going to pick weak acid for this on test day. I'm not going to be super happy about it because I think it could be a strong acid, but it's really unlikely because it's weakly conducted electricity and I know most of my strong acids and this doesn't look like them. And so um, it's a long yeah. story short. I'm still going to pick C, which is the correct answer, but I'm not super excited about it. Yeah. And I think that's a really great point, right? Like first and foremost, we we have to keep in mind that this test is still written by people <laughs> and inevitably there, you know, there may be gaps and whatnot. Um, and so what you do is you do the best you can with the information you're given. The combined, like you said, you know, we know the difference between dissolving and dissociation and the weekly conducting okay, maybe leans us a little bit more towards weak. And um, we get a, a, um, a higher pH than if it were strong. And we know it doesn't look like any of the strong ones we know. So we're going to go with weak acid. But recognizing that if you are given more information, you will pause and, you know, think a little bit more and maybe do some calculations to make sure that it's weak versus strong um, yeah. on, on uh, test. Like if they were to have given you the concentration um, of There's of the a little bit more to do, itself, right? Exactly. Yeah. I do think just as one other side note, this is going to frustrate students. Like I, I can feel your frustration <laughs> through this of like, wait, like this is a, this is actually a bad question. Like I said, the, the MCAT writers, like of the like two and a half, almost 3000 questions that the MCAT has asked, I have a problem with like two of them. Um, and so it's a really low incidence of having these problems. The MCAT writers are humans. And this is, this is just has to do with how hard the MCAT is that like you can get a perfect score on the MCAT and still miss questions. And so th it's hard for MCAT writers to ask questions that are like perfect um, because the M because it's so like cutting edge, like this pushes the boundaries of even the MCAT writers, what they know about, and like, it's pretty difficult. And so I understand it's a little bit frustrating to be like, oh, like this question is not a good one. And this is from the AAMC. This is from the people who make the exam. But this is also why it takes a month to get your scores back. It's not just because they like making you wait. It's because they need to do some data analysis of what's going on with the scores. Like if the top 10% of students all missed one question, maybe there's something wrong with that question, right? Maybe they need to go back and take a look at that. So the MCAT writers will occasionally throw out questions. I think there's a chance that if this question showed up on your test day, this question might actually end up getting thrown out because there's a problem with the question in and of itself. Um, and I know that that's a little bit, um, that's a little bit like frustrating, but note that if you do come across something like this, it's it's very rare. Like I said, less than a 0.1% chance. There's a 99.9% .9 chance the question's a good one from all the questions I've seen from the AAMC. Um, but if you do come across a bad one, that's probably going to get thrown out on the day of your actual test. Okay, sorry, yeah. long spiel <laughs> on that. <laughs> so on to the next question. Two additional compounds were studied. Um, so I'm not actually going to say the name because I'll mention it afterwards. So NO2OH dissolved in water and produced an acidic solution, and NiOH2 dissolved only in an acidic solution. What type of compounds are these? So right off the bat, we actually just need the information that's in here. We don't. We need very little from the actual passage itself, and now we'll talk about why. The first one dissolved in water and produced an acidic solution, so it should be an acid. Right off the bat, we can get rid of B and we can get rid of C. Then the second one only dissolved in an acidic solution. We know that if we try and dissolve an acid in another acid, it's not going to go very well. 
right? Whereas an acid will dissolve in a base and a base will dissolve in an acid. So if this is dissolving in an acid, it is a base, which only leaves me with D. So yes, D mentions oxy acid from the passage, but I don't actually need that information to answer this question. Now, other names for these compounds, it's nitric acid. So if I recognized what it was, they just rearranged it a little bit, I would know right off the bat that it's an acid. But even in the absence of immediately recognizing that rearrangement, um, I can still answer this question. And nickel hydroxide, anytime you know we see something like that, we have an idea of what it is. Um, but I don't, this is essentially a pseudo discrete. I don't actually need the passage. It is related to the topic. It's very easy to get the question correct on its own as long as we know the basic properties of acids and bases, which makes me really happy that we had a whole podcast on acids and bases a couple of, of weeks ago. Yeah. I think we even talked about nitric acid in that. I think that, we did. <laughs> that, um episode. I do want to point out, this is another kind of like classic MCAT thing where there's actually three different ways to solve this question. One is you recognize that's nitric acid and you recognize nickel hydroxide is a base. And you're like, okay, that one's an acid, that one's a base, just because I know that. Um, now, if you didn't catch that this was nitric acid, because this like rearrangement is a little bit weird. And I think some students are going to miss this. Just like you, you said, like they said, we put this in water and it made it acidic that thing's an acid. This thing <laughs> dissolved in an acid. So then it's a base because it reacted with an acid. That's something to, that's a, the second way to solve this. The third way is like going to what's going on here. Like if something's a, a metal, the compound is basic. Like from the second paragraph, nickel is a metal. So it's a base. If it's not a metal, it's an acid. Nitrogen is not a metal. And so that's going to be an acid. So you could use the second paragraph you could use just the stuff in the question, or you could just use your outside knowledge. And there's like three different ways to solve that question. Um, this is why it's so important to review these things, because a lot of times students will see like one way to answer it. And even if you got the question correct, this is why it's really important to review. And like, I think this will be really useful if people listen to these podcasts, because then they'll start to see other ways to solve questions. And so those those do occur. Yeah. That's that's why we're doing this right mm -hmm. at the end of the day to get you guys thinking like the test writers. And when you're yeah. able to learn how some questions are targeted in multiple or can be answered from multiple different perspectives, you can then zoom out and actually apply those same principles to other questions, even if not the same exact reasoning. Right. So if we go to question 13, the central atom A of the unknown compound was most likely... This is another easy gimme question. If you understood that this thing was an acid, then, I mean, like kind of the question 10, 11, and 13 were all kind of the same question about this molecule, right? Mm -hmm. Question A is what's the pH of this? It's five, so it's acidic. Question like 11 is it, what type of compound is it? Like, oh, it's a, probably a weak acid. It's definitely an acid, but probably a weak acid. And this question is like, oh, what is this unknown thing? Well, I mean, if this is an acid, they say, then this has got to be a nonmetal. And that's like straight from that second paragraph. So the answer is nonmetal. It's as simple as that of just recognizing, hey, this is an acidic solution. So C is the answer. Um, yeah. yeah. I've been itching to say this. I know this is different from, from our previous podcast style, but as you were talking about like an acid in, in powder dissolving um, and the difference in dissolving and dissociation, I, I used to make like handmade, like homemade soap and use lye, use potassium lye. hydroxide in powder form. And that was just all I could think about. I was like, oh my gosh, it would be really nice to make some soap again. Yeah. <laughs> so if, that's... if anyone is interested and wants to like geek out and nerd out a little bit doing some chemistry and has a safe environment to do so <laughs> take a look at soap making it's actually really cool yeah you have to be careful with the lye with the, yes. the base yes. because it's a pretty strong base oh, but that yeah. reaction that occurs that saponification reaction is it turns like um like these compound or these complex uh, fatty acid compounds into soap is super interesting. Yeah. Um, but yeah, you're right. I was thinking about the same thing as like, I know that lye comes in powder. I've never made soap, but I've seen the movie uh, Fight Club and lye is used in that because they're <laughs> soap making and that is super interesting. Yeah. Um, that, that doesn't, most people wouldn't characterize that as a chemistry focused movie. 
but there is some <laughs> chemistry in there. Um, but yeah, absolutely. Uh, so we do have a quick announcement. Um, so there is the, so you heard us talk about the Student Doctor Network um, during one of our prior podcasts, and their first webinar is actually going to be on October 12th. That's going to be at 3 p.m. Pacific time. So you can go ahead and email events at jackweston.com to RSVP. There's also going to be a description uh, or there's going to be a link in the description for this video. We want you guys to go ahead, sign up RSVP. And we're really excited to partner with the Student Doctor Network, as mentioned before. Yeah. Yeah. It's super exciting. I know I've mentioned this before, but the Student Doctor Network has been a really useful leading resource for pre-med students forever, um, including when I was applying to med school, which was forever ago. Um, and they have never partnered with a prep company, but they are partnering with us because of all the resources that we want to give to students. So hopefully you guys are um, interested in that, checking that out. Um, once again, it's October 12th and it's events with an S at jackweston.com. Mm -hmm.